Columbus Women's Commission works to advance the economic well-being of women in our community. We use data to get to the root causes of issues that limit women's opportunities. And with the support of Mayor Ginther's office and our community partners, focus in four key areas. Pay equity, housing and evictions, health, and workforce development. The issues the commission is addressing are real. One in four women in central Ohio lacks basic economic security. Columbus women working full time make 78 cents for every dollar a man earns. And over 52,000 households in Columbus are single female headed. And for the women in those households, the poverty rate is more than six times higher. We believe all women should have the opportunity to succeed. Our commissioners are passionate experts with diverse backgrounds, digging deep to understand the issues that limit women's opportunities and are focused on creating change. We are a convener of community conversations and making big change happen quickly. We engage with Columbus residents to elevate women's issues. We believe in the women in our community and in the power of their stories. We know that together we can make bold things happen. We are the Columbus Women's Commission. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome. It is wonderful to see this room fill up and the energy that I have felt over the last 30 minutes. I think it means we need to be in conversation intentionally more. Um, my name is Shelley Biding. I am the Executive Director of the Columbus Women's Commission in the office of Mayor Ginther. And thank you for coming out this evening to join in conversation, to hear about the work of the Women's Commission and to give us your ideas, as well as to learn from others through the conversations. When we put the invitation out for this event, we had 250 RSVPs in four days. We had a tremendous response from our community, and again, of individuals desiring to be a part of the conversation. So thank you for raising your hand to be with us this evening. One of our roles as a commission is to understand the needs facing women in our community, to both look at the data, but also to listen to experiences. We recognize that bringing together a group of diverse individuals from diverse perspectives, from life and professional experiences is critical to problem solving. So here is a brief walk through our agenda this evening. First, we will hear from First Lady Shannon Ginther, the chair of the Columbus Women's Commission. Then we will hear from five commissioners who will share about the work of the commission during our inaugural year. So what they've learned as commissioners, the data that has guided our conversations, and then where we see opportunities to impact advocacy and policy here in our city. After that, we'll transition to hearing each of your voices. When I looked at the definition of town hall, I found it is a way to meet with the community to both hear from them on topics of interest and to answer questions. And so we have built in both of those pieces into our agenda this evening. We'll have 30 minutes of conversation at your table where there is a member of the Women's Commission or from the mayor's office seated with you to hear your feedback about our work and to hear your ideas. We'll then have 20 minutes of question and answers with our commissioners. So we have a robust agenda for the next 90 minutes. So thank you for being with us in this space this evening. A couple housekeeping items. There are refreshments and beverages on the side. There are restrooms um, towards the back, down the stairs, or there is an elevator available also. Um, so we know this is a time that uh, many of you may have been seated all day. So move around, have some energy uh, as we go throughout this evening together. So to get our conversation going this evening, it's my honor to introduce to you the chair of the Columbus Women's Commission, First Lady Shannon Gunther. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you for being a part of the conversation this evening. When my husband took office two years ago, I had the opportunity to put my efforts behind this community. And I knew right away that I wanted to focus on one, advancing the economic well-being of Columbus's women. 
I believe in the power of women's stories. I believe in passionately seeking answers. I believe in the women of Columbus. Having worked in health and healthcare administration for the majority of my career, I have a great understanding of some of the challenges that women face. Working toward the goal of impacting these challenges, in early 2017, the mayor and I launched the Columbus Women's Commission. With our inaugural class, we had more than 245 individuals apply to be part of the commission. And in our latest round of applications, an additional 90 submitted ap applications. I'm excited that more than 335 individuals in our community have raised their hands to be part of this work. It reminds me of just how important the work is to our community. We currently have 21 appointed commissioners, each serving two-year terms. I would like to publicly recognize and thank the commissioners for their efforts and serving on the commission. Would the commissioners please stand? And would the audience please thank me in joining them for their service? Join me in thanking them for their service. <laughs> The Commission has convened conversations to build on existing work in our community and to identify where the Commission is uniquely positioned to create change. We've held multiple community outreach meetings and focus groups and uncovered layers of data. The issues the Commission is addressing are real. As referenced in the video, one in four women in Central Ohio lacks basic economic security. We also know that 38% of women earn less than $15 an hour in the Columbus metropolitan area. So to impact women's economic position, the charge of the commission is focused in four key areas. Pay equity, affordable housing, workforce development, and health. In just a little bit, you'll hear from our committee chairs about work specific to each of these areas the data that grounded us, and our approach to change the story for women. My hope for this work and for this community is that we can better understand the root cause of issues that limit, limit women's opportunities, that we bring people together from diverse backgrounds and perspectives to work with one another on these challenging issues and that we increase awareness and influence policy that will change women's experiences here in our community. We believe that together we can make bold things happen. We believe that diversity is mighty. We believe in the women of Columbus. I'd now like to welcome Commissioner Barb Smoot to the podium. Thank you, First Lady Ginther. I'm here tonight as the chair of the Pay Equity Committee. My day job is president and CEO of WELD, Women for Economic and Leadership Development. I raise my hand to be a part of this work because when the right thing is staring you in the face, you don't blink. You put your back and your brains into it and you get it done. With a focus on, women's, on improving women's economic lives, one of the policy areas that rose to the top of the Commission's radar early on was gender and race-based pay equity. This drove the establishment of the Pay Equity Committee. We learned women in Columbus earned 78 cents for every dollar earned by a man. That's below the national statistic of 80 cents on the dollar. For women of color, the statistics are even worse. 63 cents for African-American women, and 54 cents for Latina women. In Columbus as a community, we do not like or strive to be average, let alone be below average. The pay, this pay gap is real. When considering the pay losses over a time, the economic impact for women and families is staggering. Over the course of a career, women's total earnings loss compared with men are $700,000 for a high school graduate, 1.2 million for a college graduate, and 2 million for a professional school graduate. We knew something had to, be, had to happen to make bold change in this community on this issue. On April 4th, 2017, 
a day nationally recognized as Equal Pay Day, the Columbus Women's Commission held a leadership breakfast to highlight this very issue in our community for public, private, and nonprofit sector leaders. The energy in the room was phenomenal. It was clear our community's leadership was impacted by the information and ready to roll up its sleeves to make an impact on gender and race-based pay equity. The committee took the energy from the leadership breakfast and continued exploring ways to make an impact. We learned from cities such as Boston, Seattle, and Denver about their approach to this issue. We held focus groups to hear from employers, HR experts, and employees, those who are on the front lines of this issue. After all the research and learning, the Columbus Women's Commission officially launched the Columbus Commitment, Achieving Pay Equity, on November 2nd, 2017, also known as Latina Equal Pay Day. The Columbus Commitment is a voluntary employer-led pledge to address gender and race-based wage gaps. The commitment asked employers to learn about the gender pay gap, understand how race and other factors create even larger disparities, analyze and review internal policies, and take action to build awareness around the unique challenges facing women in the workplace. The commitment goes beyond just the numbers and equal pay for equal work, which are still vitally important, but is also about where women are in companies and ensuring the opportunity to succeed. We are thrilled to have reached 100 adopters of the commitment. Our focus now is to sustain and grow the initiative. We are working to ensure we offer adopters the inspiration, tools, and resources to implement best practices, things like removing salary history from applications, encouraging company-wide implicit bias training, and tools to do gender and race-based pay equity analysis, mentoring and sponsorship, you name it, especially through our very first best practices session this May, the Columbus Commitment from Signature to Action. If your company CEO signs that pledge, you will get an, invita an invitation to that event. We know there is no one-size-fits-all solution to this issue. There are many ways to impact the gender and race-based wage gap. In terms of growth, we are actively doing outreach to grow the number of Central Ohio employers who have adop adopted the commitment. There are materials, including the commitment form itself, for every one of you here today. Know that these are also available online and for download at the Columbus Women's Commission website also. Every one of you can help with this initiative by advocating for your employer to sign the commitment or by helping implement positive changes in your work environment. We know 100% pay equity is a fuel that will make our community thrive and are excited to, to continue and expand this work. I would now like to welcome my esteemed commissioner, Jeff Little, to the podium. Thank you. Good evening, thank you, Barb. It's an honor to be here tonight to represent the commission and as chair of its housing committee. I'm a proud husband of the remarkable Kathy Little. We were just talking about her at my table. And uh, father to Jack Little and my new daughter-in-law, Tori. Their energy and commitment make me extremely optimistic about this and the next generation of leaders in Columbus. It's also my privilege to have uh, been a member of the J.P. Morgan Chase Columbus leadership team for more than two decades and to have served as a volunteer on more than a dozen civic and nonprofit boards. I raised my hand to be part of this work for two reasons. One, I was born and raised in Columbus and I love this city. And two, because as the current chair of the Community Shelter Board, I was witnessing a troubling rise in poverty and homelessness, particularly among women and families, in, in the midst of our city's obvious growth and prosperity. Access to safe, affordable housing is a critically important issue in our community and across the country. It's an issue the Commission immediately identified as a priority, and we have spent the past eight months seeking to identify the ways we can make a positive, positive contribution in this area. Here's some of what we learned from a 2016 study led by the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, 95% of homeless families in our community were headed by women at the time of the study. 
and an outsized percentage of those women, 71%, were African American. These families have an average of two children, mostly under the age of seven. We've met with many partners and experts to gain more perspective on these numbers and make sure we understood where our various partners prioritizing housing in our community are focusing their time and expertise. We didn't want to waste time and resources by duplicating the good work of others. Through these conversations and studying data like this, the issue of evictions emerged. While not all evictions lead to homelessness, we know a troubling number of homeless women and families have faced an eviction. And we know our eviction numbers in Franklin County are notable and not for a good reason. In 2016, we had 18,000 eviction filings. That's right at the top among Ohio's 88 counties. This map shows where the eviction filings occurred in our community. The large, darker red uh, circles show where the highest concentration of filings exist. Among the 54 Franklin County zip codes, more than four in 10 eviction filings happened in just six of the zip codes. The most occurred in the hilltop community to the west, uh, Whitehall and Blacklick to the east, and in the Northland area. So why do we think reducing the number of evictions is so important? It's because an eviction results in many difficult and long-term consequences. Evictions negatively impact your credit report and your rental history, making it difficult to find new housing, particularly in our highly competitive Columbus housing market. You may lose your belongings during the eviction process. They're often put out at the curb and people don't have an appropriate place to store them. Evicted renters may lose their housing assistant vouchers. They may lose their job due to missed work. Kids may fall behind in school. And we know that unstable and poor housing can even affect the physical health of children and their caregivers. To strengthen our focus on this issue, members of the Women's Commission have been joined by representatives from municipal court, city council, the county commissioners, the city attorney's office, the mayor's office, and Legal Aid Society of Columbus. Together, we've been listening, learning, and observing, seeking opportunities to recommend changes to our processes and policies that could lead to the reduction of the number of evictions we're, we're seeing in Franklin County. We spent hours in the eviction and environmental courts. We've met with the judges and magistrates who oversee them. And we traveled to Cleveland for an eye-opening day observing and learning uh, about what Cuyahoga County is doing to address the eviction issue. We're thoughtfully considering a number of strategies to address equity issues and to ensure tenants facing eviction have the tools and resources to help them navigate the process. The Commission sees a clear intersection between our mission to dismantle barriers and reduce gender-based inequities to improve the economic position of all women in our community and the ongoing displacement of women and families that threatens to destabilize vulnerable members of our community. So with that, I'd like to invite Commissioner Daphne Kaklaudis to the podium. Good evening. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that uh, introduction. I'm here tonight as the chair of the Workforce Development Committee of the Commission. Um, in my day job, I serve as Equitas Health's Chief Public Policy and Strategy Officer. I'm also a partner at the law firm Brennan, Mann and Diamond. Um, I raised my hand to be part of this work because I want to use my platform as a woman with resources, relationships, and professional expertise to lift up all women. I've spent my career working in public policy at the state and federal levels um, on these issues. Um, but my role as chair of the Workforce Development Committee affords me an opportunity to get my hands dirty at the local level um, affecting policy, and that's really important, um, not just to me, but to everyone in our community. 
When the commission determined uh, that workforce is an area of focus, we st also started looking, st started by looking at the data, like um, my fellow commissioners mentioned. We sort of got our hands dirty, um, looked at some of the statistics that really impact this policy area. Uh, so I want to share with you some, um, some data points that I think are illuminative uh, related to workforce um, and benefit cliff issues. Um, as was mentioned in the video, if you didn't hear it, um, there are more than 52,000 households in Columbus that are female-headed with no spouse present. In central Ohio, the poverty rate is more than six times higher for women in female-headed households. The poverty rate for female-headed households with children under the age of five is 51%. Nationally, 42% of women with children under the age of 18 are the sole or primary breadwinners for their family. When looking at those in the workforce, almost two-thirds of mothers with children under age six are working outside the home. And local data also indicates that childcare costs represent more than 30% of the basic budget expenses for a woman with two children. So these issues aren't just women's issues. They impact an entire family and certainly children. These data points that I just recited highlight the interconnectivity of work, workforce, and family. So to better understand the landscape of child care in our community, the committee embarked on a journey to learn from partners and those working in areas of workforce and child care. We met with Workforce Development Board, Franklin County Department of Job and Family Services, the YMCA, the YWCA, Action for Children, the city's Department of Education, and many others. Um, and, and representatives from these organizations regularly um, sit in on our committee meetings um, and help inform the conversation, which always ensures a really robust dialogue. Uh, the discussions we had with leaders in these, um, in these organizations reinforced something that we had already suspected, which is that access to good child care enables parents, especially mothers, to enter and remain in the workforce, which supports broader economic growth not just for, for those women and families, but for the communities. And in particular, it's financially essential for low-income families who need two incomes to stay afloat or who depend on one parent as the sole breadwinner. As we began to explore child care and the issues um, that surround child care, its relation to women and the benefits cliff also became an area of interest. The benefits cliff is a term that is used to describe when a slight increase in earnings results in a loss of benefits, such as publicly subsidized food access, housing, or child care, to name a few. This scenario oftentimes is a disincentive for individuals to take a job promotion or a raise, and more broadly, stifles the potential of an individual to better his or her own circumstances. The work of the, through the work of the committee, we also learned about the Step Up to Quality program and the state requirement that all child care programs must have a minimum of one star in the rating system by July of 2020 to continue to receive publicly funded child care dollars. If the rating requirement went into effect today, more than 28,000 children could potentially lose access to childcare in our community. To further our understanding of these issues and the relationship between childcare and workforce, we knew we needed to hear from women in our community. So after we engaged in sort of an academic process with our partners and learning about the issues and what sort of uh, bubbled up to the top as, as the issues of significance. Um, we knew we had to hear from women in our community, and mothers in particular. So earlier this year, uh, just a month or so ago, we hosted three focus groups, um, learning from 32 mothers in our communities, and heard firsthand their experiences and gained insight into barriers and limitations surrounding child care and employment. So we are now in the process of reviewing and analyzing the focus group data. Um, in order to inform our next steps, but some themes in those conversations do stand out. Those include the cost of child care, uh, measuring the cost of child care against a paycheck, sort of doing that cost benefit analysis that women are doing every day, um, accessing quality child care that works 
for their schedules, with their schedules. So that's not just you know options in the summer versus during the school year, but also um, whether childcare is accessible to their home or job. Um, it's you know not it's not um, tenable for a mother to have to drive or take public transportation or rely on someone else to help if childcare is not convenient. Um, and in each of the focus group uh, focus groups that we did, we heard from. Um, women about their concerns balancing working with being a parent. Um, participants clearly demonstrated an awareness of opportunity cost related to progressing in their careers. And another really important takeaway from the focus groups is um, not just access to childcare, but to quality childcare. Um, all, all parents, all mothers want their children to have access to childcare opportunities that will help them um, grow and develop. So we're continuing to analyze and discuss the results of the focus groups to inform our work moving forward as we examine opportunities for policy advancement in this space, so stay tuned. Um, we'll have more to share in the relatively near future. We're always interested in your um, input, so please feel free to, to share that um, with me or with another commissioner tonight. And now I'd like to introduce Kate McGarvey, my fellow commissioner. Thank you, Daphne. I'm here tonight as the chair of the Health Committee. I'm also the director at the Legal Aid Society of Columbus, which provides civil legal help to low-income individuals and families in Central Ohio. Throughout my time at Legal Aid, my practice has focused on health and public benefits, so I was thrilled when the Women's Commission decided to have a committee focused on health. I raised my hand to be a part of this work because I see what is often referred to as the feminization of poverty every day. In 2007, 69% of the almost 17,000 people that our office impacted were women. And every day I see those women and their children in our office struggling to have their voice heard in the justice system. So I applied to be on the commission to help us at LASC better serve our female clients and also in hopes that our insights from working with women in poverty would help shape better outcomes for women citywide. The Health Committee just launched last month, so we are only in the very early stages of our work. We're learning about what health-related issues are facing women in Columbus and where the Commission is uniquely positioned to create change. There are several issues that we have already begun discussing. For example, we know that where you live matters. In South Clintonville, where I live, our family and our neighbor's life expectancy is 80 years of age. Yet in South Linden, which is within walking distance of my house, only over the freeway, the life expectancy dips to 69.7 years. Infant mortality is another issue that has been a key area of focus for Mayor Genther and our community. We have made strides as a community to decrease the number of children who die in their sleep. But we also know that our infant mortality rate remains far too high and that we continue to lose black babies at a far higher rate than white babies. So we are thinking about how social determinants of health impact mothers, how policy can be an integral part of our strategy, and whether the Women's Commission should play a role in that work. We are also each aware of the devastation that the opiate crisis has had in our neighborhoods and in many of our families. An amazing amount of work and community effort has happening and is happening, yet there's still a long way to go. We are curious about what happens when we bring a gender lens to the conversation. What are the unique needs and approaches for women dealing with opiate addictions or for women who are pregnant and dealing with addiction? The Commission also hopes to explore women's access to health education and to safe and affordable care. We know that early access to health education and to reproductive health services especially long-acting reversible contraceptives, are crucial to women's life planning abilities and to long-term economic stability. The committee will spend the next six months listening and learning, including meeting with experts in the areas of healthcare delivery, reproductive health, the opiate epidemic, and spending a day with Judge Herbert in Catch Court, a specialty doc docket for victims of sex trafficking. We're especially looking forward to the conversations at the tables tonight and to hearing your ideas about areas of opportunity to address the health needs of women in our community. With that, I would like to invite Commissioner Christy Angel to the podium.
Thank you, Kate. Good evening. I am here tonight as a member of the Columbus Women's Commission Executive Committee. I am Christy Angel, as Kate said, and I am the new president and CEO of the YWCA. I raised my hand to be a part of this work long before I ever thought I would be the president and CEO of the YWCA. <laughs> I raised my hand because the playing field is not, let, not yet level for women, especially women of color. I raised my hand because I am passionate about making life better for women and thus families in this community. I raised my hand because far too many times I walk into shelters like the one I, the YWCA runs over on the east side or the one like the YMCA runs on the west side and the women there look like me. Better yet, they look like they could be my daughter, maybe even my granddaughter. After becoming president and CEO of the YWCA, I raised both of my hands for the Columbus Women's Commission. I raised both of my hands because the YWCA cannot fulfill its mission to eliminate racism and empower women without the Women's Commission. Why do you ask? Because we can only do so much by working on pro with programs, but policies have to change too if we expect to make a difference and have long-lasting change. I am motivated, motivated every time I come to a Columbus Women's Commission meeting or a committee meeting because I see all of the women that you see in this room today and others who come at this for, from a volunteer, for, for, as a volunteer experience, not for their day job. We come at this because we know that we have to get to work, we have to roll up our sleeves, we have to make the changes to impact some of the things that you've heard about uh, from our panelists. I am motivated by all of you in this room and those who can't be here with us today because they are working, they are picking up children, they are trying to find food, they are in our shelters, they are uh, on a bus. I am motivated by all of the women in this community because we have to do for them what perhaps they can't do for themselves. I am motivate, voted, motivated by the idea that we all bring different experiences, we look differently, we come from different backgrounds, but ultimately we want to create a better Columbus, the Columbus that we all believe in. We want to create a better Columbus for women, and thus we want to create a better Columbus for our families and for their families. And so I thank you for being here with us tonight, for giving us just a little bit of your time to share with us what your vision is for women in Columbus. Now let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for sharing about our work, um, for the individual and collective passion that you bring to this space. Um, we are a working commission. Uh, when these individuals raised their hand, we had the conversation and said, we're gonna get to work, are you ready? And they were all ready. So thank you for your service to our community. First Lady Shannon Ginther has provided the focus for the work of the commission and ensuring that we are staying committed to all women in our community. You heard about our pillars around pay equity, housing, workforce development, and health. There's another individual with us tonight who has provided leadership, vision, and a shared responsibility in this work. And it's my honor to introduce our mayor, Mayor Andrew Ginther. Good evening, and what a great night in the city of Columbus. I am so thrilled at uh, the turnout and engagement, and I promise I will be one of the last speakers from the podium, because we're here to hear from you. We wanted to offer a framework and background on what's taken place thus far, but wanted to engage you tonight in the work of the commission uh, in our direction uh, and focus moving forward. You know, my, my goal and vision for the city is for us to become America's opportunity city. 
a city with the largest middle class of any city our size in the country, and a place you're more likely to go from poverty to the middle class and beyond than anywhere else in America. So the Women's Commission and the work of empowering women and helping them become more financially secure and independent is absolutely essential for us to realize that vision. We can't become America's opportunity city unless we first become America's equal opportunity city. And so your work, your passion, the work of the commission is absolutely essential. If we are going to empower, support, and make sure that the stability of our families, that is the foundation of neighborhoods. If you have instability in our families, our neighborhoods can't thrive. And if our neighborhoods aren't thriving, we have a mediocre city. And mediocre isn't good enough to you and I. We want a city that's thriving, that every family in every neighborhood can share in the success story that is Columbus. And that means women's economic empowerment and financial security is critical if we're going to reach our full potential. So I'm grateful for all of you that uh, have participated, have attended other events. Uh, I am thrilled that our private sector, nonprofit, and government entities have stepped up around pay equity. I am excited about the work that lies ahead around eviction reform and making sure that we as a community don't lead the country in evictions, but are doing everything in our power to stabilize families and support families to make sure that they are able to succeed throughout this great city. So thank you all for being here tonight. I want to thank Shannon for her incredible leadership and, and vision, uh, to Shelley, the rest of the team, all of these outstanding commissioners. I'm grateful for their service. And know this, there is not important more central part of our policy agenda as a city than the recommendations and the work that's coming out of the Women's Commission. This is not a separate initiative. This is not a standalone project. It is the core of our policy agenda as a city because we can't realize my vision of becoming America's opportunity city unless we continue to empower and make sure that the women in this community are financially secure in leading the way to that shared prosperity. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Mayor Ginther, for your leadership, your vision, and your unwavering support of equity in our community. And now we are going to transition to the part of the agenda where we are going to start hearing your voices. Um, I'd like to introduce Tuesday Ryan Hart. Um, Tuesday and her business partner, Deb Helber, have been instrumental strategic partners um, to the work of the commission this past year. And she is going to move us into our table conversations. Tuesday. Okay, as Christy said, it is time for us to get to work. And fortunately, tonight getting to work means we get to talk with each other. Because we know if we're gonna take on some of these large issues, evictions, health, workforce development in the benefits cliff, pay equity, that not one person can have the answer. And in fact, even a group of 25 committed, skillful, wonderful, brilliant, connected, influential people cannot have all of the answers. And so we need your input and we need your insight. And so we're gonna move into some conversation tonight at your tables about what has your attention, what's up for you around these issues, what do we need to know to be able to do this well. And so we're so pleased you're with us. And I'm going to move us through a little bit of how to be in conversation. Now, most of us think we're pretty good at conversation, and most of us are. And 
there's all, we can always be better, right? We can always be better. And in fact, actually at tables of 10, it can be a little challenging to be in conversation. So I'm gonna give us a few tips for conversation and they're not rules. No one's gonna come and tell you you did it wrong, but I'm just gonna ask you to follow these tips. Um, and the first is to speak from experience, right? So we, we invited you, hopefully you came because you have good experience. And so we'd like you to speak from that experience. Please feel free to say, this is what I know, this is what I've learned, this is who I am, right? And speak from that experience. What that means is, maybe not speak from the latest TED talk or the academic paper you read, right? Like we actually want you to speak from your experience and not kind of what other folks think. Um, so speak from your experience, we welcome that, we want that in this room, that's why you're here. Uh, the second tip is to listen to learn. And so that means that we're listening to each other to learn from each other, maybe not to debate or rebut or to say our point next, right? So sometimes we listen to kind of think, oh, because I want to say that, right? And so when we listen to learn, we say, okay, what can I learn here? We lean in, right? We say, what is there for me to understand here a little bit more? So even if someone is saying something you really disagree with, there might be something you can learn, even if it's just how to make a better argument later, right? But so we're just, you know, we're listening to learn here. Uh, notice your impact. And this kind of has something to do with the speak from experience and listening to learn. If you are a person who is really good at speaking from your experience, maybe you want to try to listen to learn a little bit more. And if you're a person who listens to learn quite well, maybe you want to speak in a little bit more, right? Um, just take yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, stretch yourself a little bit. And to do that, you might want to notice your impact. Notice the amount of space you're taking at the table, right? We've got different levels of power and influence here. We've got different levels of relationship. Sometimes just knowing other people at your table makes you freer to speak. And so notice your impact. Allow everyone else at your table to have some time. Share the air is kind of a way to think about that. Uh, and so, you know, if you notice yourself speaking a lot, maybe listen to learn. If you notice yourself listening, please, we need your voice. And so please speak a little bit more. And finally, if you'd like to capture themes, would be great. Um, if things keep coming up at your table, that's worth noticing, right? If every one of us have talked about kind of a different aspect, but childcare is underneath it all, or um, wealth is underneath it all, or uh, I don't know what your themes will be, but that's worth noticing, right? Notice what comes up time and time again. Listen and capture themes. And by the same token, you might wanna capture outliers because sometimes it's that thing that comes out of left field that's actually got the most juice for us, is the most interesting. So those are some tips for conversation. Just to say too, tables of six to 10 can be hard to stay in conversation together. So we're just gonna invite you to please speak to your entire table. What can happen sometimes is we get off in little pairs or in trios and that's okay, but it actually doesn't help everyone hear your voice, right? And so we're gonna ask you to stay at your table conversations, right? And be speaking to the whole group and that means no side conversations. It just makes a better conversation, right? So that's all we're asking. You have a table um, host. Each table has a table host. Is, can we raise our hands just so folks know? Great, at every table there's a table host. They'll kind of move you through a set of questions, right? So you don't have to remember all of these things. They'll move you through a set of questions for the next 30 minutes. Um, the last thing to say, because you're about to move into conversation, you each have these papers on your table. If at your table conversation you don't get a question answered or it just doesn't come up but it's still actually a burning question for you like you really need to know what the answer to that question is please write it down with your contact information we're going to come around Shelly and Aaron and I are going to come around during these conversations and pick these up and then we'll come around at the end again but we're going to use these to support kind of the QA at the end and if we don't get to your question, we're gonna follow up with you with the answer, right? So we don't want you to leave here saying, boy, I wish I knew the answer to that question. You might, but you'll get it, right? We wanna make sure that we're following up for people. So every table has one of these. Please feel free to fill them out if it's a question you haven't gotten to or that you're just really curious about. We'll come around and pick them up. Also, please just be in a good conversation. We all know what a good conversation is. We've all been in a conversation that really engages us and really captures us. And so the invitation tonight is to make sure that happens at your table. Okay.
Table hosts, you have about 30 minutes for conversation. There's a lot of good conversation going, but you also gave us a lot of really great questions, and we want to give uh, some of the commissioners a chance to respond to some of these questions. So we're going to move into the QA and keep ourselves moving here. So my first question, well, let's see, make sure we have our mics on. Thank you. And keep in mind, we will not get to all of the questions tonight. We absolutely won't, but we hopefully have your contact information and we will get back to you. So, uh, and so we've asked the commissioners in about a minute to answer their questions. So just kind of bear with us. Our first question is going to be for Barb. So Barb, the question is what kinds of companies have signed the commitment to date? And then what are the expectations? If you sign the commitment, what are the expectations for a company? The neat thing is that um, if you look at the list of companies that sign the pledge, they are extremely diverse. Just as Columbus is diverse, you're looking at ex extremely large uh, public companies as well as nonprofit organizations, uh, medium-sized businesses, um, a city of uh, our own city as well. So about 100, exactly 100 companies have signed. Um, on your table, I would like to point out that there's a little card that's about this big. Do you see that in the center of the table? That is the actual commitment. Can someone please hand that up? If you flip that card over, it lists the four things that we are asking companies to do when they sign that pledge. Um, this is not just a figurehead sort of thing. Number one, it's expected that the CEO of the company signs the pledge. Uh, we want to see uh, the companies to um, educate their workforces and, and, and leadership about the impacts of pay disparities, understanding the root causes of them, um, reviewing their pay, uh, pay data to see if they can identify dis uh, disparities, put together a strategy and actually implement it to close pay gaps, and also to attend the pay equity best practices session that we will be holding every single year. Um, so that, in a nutshell, in one minute, is what we're, who has signed the <laughs> pledge and what we're asking them to do. You are welcome to take those cards back with you, and we encourage you to please share them with your employers. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Okay, we're just going to go down the line. Jeff? Okay. So our question is, what is causing the higher eviction rates? Someone asked specifically in Blacklick, but we'd love to know if you know in certain communities what's causing the higher eviction rates. and. Uh, what is CSB doing in this space? So since you're the chair of the shelter board, what, what are they doing in this space? Um, so the neighborhoods tend to be high rental neighborhoods. That makes sense. So there's a higher density of rental units uh, in the neighbor, in the zip codes where we're seeing the highest number uh, of eviction filings. Um, they tend to also be low income areas of the community. So we have more unstable renters who uh, uh, face issues that lead to eviction notices. Um, so I don't think anyone was shocked at the uh, zip codes that emerged. I think that we were shocked at the concentration overall in the county that of the 54 zip codes, only six really emerged uh, for 40 percent, more than 40 percent of the evictions overall. Um, the shelter board has historically been very focused on being the emergency room for for homelessness in, in the community. So making sure that those people who are don't have a place to sleep have a place to sleep in, in the city. Um, so working with our providers to both do interventions to keep people out of shelter through some form of housing and to also address the issues that, that led to their crisis. Um, we have only in the last 18 months to two years really looked far upstream to issues like eviction. We actually brought in uh, the author of the book, Evicted, if you uh, hadn't heard of that, uh, 2017 Pulitzer Prize winning book. Um, the author came in and, and talked about uh, his observations, mostly around the Milwaukee area, um, getting to know both people who were facing and dealing with eviction as well as the, the landlords and the, the people on the other side of the equation. Um, and, and how it was happening. It was a really interesting conversation. So we've just in the last two years of our 25 year existence really been looking at um, the upstream issues like eviction at the shelter board. Thank you, thank you. Daphne, we have a question of kind of scale or scope for you. So the question is around, how is the commission thinking about impacting the benefits cliff? Benefits such as SNAP, 
Title 20 are delivered at the county level and funded through the state JFS. So what's possible at a city level? What can the city of Columbus do? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. One of the complexities that we've encountered um, is the sort of the layering of benefits and not just the type of benefits and not just where the policy is made. And some of it, frankly, is you know, made at the federal level and then you know, pushed down to the state and local level. Um, but also the eligibility thresholds for the program. So um, we've, there, there is an opportunity, there are opportunities to impact um, changes to policies that sort of all, you know, focus on publicly funded benefits. Um, we've made, uh, we, we've identified some of those opportunities and have um, made some recommendations um, at um, the, the county level um, and we're you know having an ongoing dialogue um, with our partners uh, at Franklin County um, so there are opportunities um, and we really have have um, done our homework to focus on thanks in large part frankly to, to Kate McGarvey who um, used to sit on our committee before she um, left us to chair the health committee um, we've been able to identify some, and, and we've spent our time focusing on some, um, some areas where we can make a significant change um, given the sort of the limited ability um, because of the layering and the regulatory structure of those benefits. Thank you. Thank you. And Kate, folks went right back to you talking about being part of legal aid and so being concerned around health. And so there's a question around where do you see health and kind of legal services intersecting? Uh, well, we work with um, health in lots of different ways. And so as a part of my practice, we have focused a lot on Medicaid. So both eligibility for Medicaid, um, also getting individuals access to services. Um, right now we're working on a whole sort of um, uh, number of cases which involves getting home care services for severely disabled kids. Um, and so we work on it from that level similarly with Medicare um, and uh, then we partner with a number of other organizations like Nationwide Children's um, and OBO to look at some of those social determinants of health so that when you have families coming in and um, kids are having problems with asthma, looking at what we can do with the mold in the house um, or getting access to transportation, um, getting assistance with domestic violence. And so it's both on the very concrete, you know, working with the healthcare coverages to make sure that they're covering who they should with the services, but then also on the social determinants of health where legal services can provide assistance um, to help get rid of some of those, those issues and barriers. One of the things I know working with commissioners is all of it is so intertwined, right? Every, every committee is impacting each other, all of these issues. Like you kind of can't pull one thread out. They're certainly all um, intersecting. So Shannon, kind of going to bring it home with the question around what is the end goal of the commission's efforts? What would you like to see? How will you um, know you're successful? It's a really good question. I think you can answer it lots of different ways. Um, one thing would be for us to move the mark on our um, census data as it relates to pay equity for women in our community. But we know that's a that's a that's the long game. That's a 10-year goal. So what are we doing in the meantime? Are we seeing the numbers of homeless people, homeless women showing up at shelters come down? Are we seeing the number of evictions come down? In any pilot or any change, policy change that we make, part of it has got to be about measuring, deciding what we're going to measure before we unpack the change or start the change, and then at the end, measuring did we actually have the impact that we intended um, with the change, and continuing that process to refine it and watching the numbers of women who are um, disproportionately impacted by poverty in our community start to change. Um, that's ultimately for me, that's what I want to see. If I, if I step out and have a vision and lead this awesome group of commissioners and people in the community who are passionate about these issues and never actually change anybody's life, then I haven't succeeded. So that's, that's what this is about for me. Um, it's, it's my passion project for sure. Thank you, thank you all. Um, 
We will, we've captured all of the questions. If you have more, you can leave them on your table and we will get back to you. So please, we don't want any questions to go unanswered. We just have a limited time this evening. I'm gonna invite the First Lady back up to close us. So thank you for, for staying with us through this event tonight, for being here, for coming out on a rainy night. Um, you know, spending time away from family and other commitments um, to understand more about the work of the Women's Commission and um, to continue the conversation with us. Um, not about us without us, isn't that what they say? So um, thank you very much for being here and um, continue to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, via our website and we'll continue to have these conversations as we move forward to improve the economic position of women in our community. Thank you.